Russia's decision to attack uh, Ukraine is something that has really strengthened the United States. And I know that, you know, there are many people out there who would disagree, but um, hear me out and I would explain a number of reasons why uh, that is so. In fact, when the conflict started, it actually reminded me of the intelligence information that came out subsequently about when the Soviet Union attacked Afghanistan, that the Americans wanted them to do it, for them to get embroiled in that conflict, which they used as a proxy war in support of the Taliban. Whilst I am clearly, I'm not saying, and I have no evidence to support that, that the United States wanted Russia to attack Ukraine, but I'm not saying that at all, I have no evidence to support that, but the effect of it has really been to strengthen the United States and solidify its core area of influence. And in a sense, one in which those countries in the core would not want to go away from it because the alternative that they face is something that they fear. So let me try and explain it you know, in a, in a simpler way as possible without being patronizing to the viewer. The first effect of the conflict was to make other countries feel insecure. And the effect of insecurity was to seek the protection of the United States. And that is in economic terms and in military terms. So prior to the conflict, there were countries who, you know, doubted to what extent the United States was necessary for NATO or for the defense of Europe. And obviously what had happened is that the, you know, the United States being the largest spender in, in NATO had effectively been providing European protection and military, you know, protection coming under that umbrella and, uh, and the nuclear umbrella for many countries that don't have uh, nuclear weapons. And the effect of it was to make certain countries feel insecure. And we look at, for example, at two countries in particular, specifically Sweden and Finland. What did they do? They rushed to try and join NATO. Finland has been able to, and um, Sweden still has some problems with Turkey in that regard. But the point is that we, we must remember that what the Swedes, what, not the Swedes, the Finns, the Finns did was that they, as a result of what happened in the Second World War and the war that happened with uh, Russia subsequently, had it agreed a treaty with the Russians whereby they would remain neutral. Now, the effect of the attack on Ukraine meant that the Finns felt insecure with their long border with Russia and looking at the options, it's either they stay neutral or come under the umbrella of NATO, in that feeling that um, if you group together, then you are afforded better protection. That is what they did. So the need for the United States is really seen as essential and important. And that means coming under the United States influence. And if the USA are providing all these things, uh, the protection that you need and providing them largely spending the money that you need, even if um, you know, other NATO um, members, and I ex exclude Turkey in some ways, um, other NATO feel insecure in a particular way, what they would not, they would not want to do in a, an uncertain world is to leave the American umbrella and feel themselves prone to attack. And we see that having the security of the American umbrella and the enforcement of Americans' um, confirmation of support for um, NATO you can see how that has emboldened, um, you know, certain countries, especially, the, you know, the Baltic states, although they were quite vocal before, and countries like Slovakia. I mean, it's, it's like you're in the playground when you have a brother in, you know, a big brother who, if something happens when you're in school, you run to big brother for some measure of protection. I certainly did that in school. But the point is that that's what it is, because these countries know that they cannot do without the United States umbrella. So... You then have, with the relationship between Russia and China, you have Japan extreme, extremely worried about what might happen to it. And the issue about Japan's worries in relation to China, for example, is founded on, I mean, I, I, let me put it bluntly, on the crimes of the, um, you know, the Japanese empire, 
what it did to many countries around it, in particular to China, and in a sense that feeling that they haven't apologized or expressed um, regret in the way that um, you know those countries, some of those countries would like them to do so, and. Japan relies heavily on, on, on the United States for its protection. The same in relation to um, South Korea. Strong then obviously its fear is about North Korea and having the American support and the recent deal for the American nuclear umbrella to protect it from North Korea shows that countries that you look at, I mean, you may have problems with two blocks, but at the end of the day, you have to think about which block best serves your interest as to whose umbrella that you would go under and that is really been the change in terms of the architecture now a lot of countries are keeping out of it but countries that feel vulnerable like australia you know feeling the influence of china their largest trading partner are going to take those steps in relation to that so in that sense what it has done the importance of america for those countries has been strengthened and I don't see that changing anytime soon. It is what it is for many, many years to come. The second aspect of it is economy. Now, um, the, the, the point is that you had an economy prior to, um, you know, Russia's attack on Ukraine and, the, and obviously then the changes that took place subsequently, whereby Germany was the industrial heartland of Europe. It um, relied on cheap Russian gas, the, the Russian... Uh, so the gas or some oil as well to them at heavily discounted prices now in that situation where you have pressure from the americans but also within europe about what you know people ought to do and you know germany had for a long time had a mercantilist approach very much about business I had this you had the situation whereby you do not they didn't want to disconnect from you know what the russians provide and the effect it would be on the economy but at the end of the day, the need for American protection or to preserve unity, because the whole point is about, you know, being unified. So, you know, that's the ethos of the EU and so that you can make decisions. I mean, you can make good decisions or bad decisions, but the key thing is about being unified. So what has happened is that rather than get, um, you know, um, gas countries voluntarily deciding not to, um, you know, get or reduce the dependency on Russia, which was about 40%, uh, you know, before the conflict and has reduced considerably, although there are a few countries that are heavily dependent like Slovakia and um, Hungary. What, what has happened is that these countries have been looking for, um, you know, for uh, gas and oil elsewhere, you know, liquefied national, uh, natural gas. And where have they gone? The United States exporting, you know, all the way across the pond. And even though what the United States exports is considerably more expensive than what the Russians, um, um, you know, were supplying. And also going to the Middle East and uh, competing with, you know, the Middle East previous suppliers. And for example, you had this issue with Qatar who said, yeah, we can supply you, but we need you to sign a long term deal, which is something that EU, EU has not been particularly um, keen about, um, for example, when he was dealing with Russia preferring ideally to go into the spot market, which, you know, can cause problems when there's a crisis. But now the United States is an essential supplier to, um, you know, Europe, and it's greatly beneficial to the American economy, you know. So, I mean, it, it took quite something to displace Russia as the main supplier for Europe, for countries to turn to, um, to, um, you know, to, to, to Saudi Arabia, to, you know, to these countries in the Middle East and also to the United States. And there, I read even one report which suggested that the Saudis are importing the Russian, um, you know, oil and then using the oil that, that, that they get, they're sending it to, you know, to European countries, uh, you know, and really a lot of money is being made by, you know, a lot of people and we can see what's happened to the oil companies in terms of the sort of massive profits they've made in you know in a particular period so the economic dependency it ties Europe closer to America the need for America economically is much stronger now than it was previously and in a sense Germany be prepared to put its industrial base at risk 
because and, and being prepared to take higher prices you know, in relation to what it pays for you know oil and gas is, is really quite significant so having made that decision to do that and relying on the americans and other places and the americans will say we told you trump said it and biden said we told you not to rely on you know russia a long time ago they are an unstable place you should be getting it from us so that economically puts the need that the Europeans have for the Americans much stronger. Now, I, I'm not really going to say much about you know the, 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 the Nord Stream pipeline and the explosion, but for me, the way I look at that is that it's just common sense that tells you who was responsible for that. I'm not going to say specifically who it was, but it's, you know, from in my view, if you apply common sense, it's plain and obvious. But the point is that, the Europeans need the Americans more than the Americans need the Europeans. And what happens is that as a result of this, and I'm not saying, I'm not criticizing it, I'm not saying it's unjustified or anything of the sort, not doing any of that. But the point is that the United States know that they are in a, comp in a competition, in competition with China. Significant competition and has been repeatedly over a period of time warning European countries about having deals with China, especially, for example, in relation to Huawei. And the way I look at the Huawei deal is that it's a simple one. Logic. If the Americans are saying, you go with Huawei, they'll be able to spy on your security. And we know the Americans spy on its allies. It makes you ask the question, is there something about what America produces in that, <laughs> you know, that has some code or something in there? That would seem entirely logical. But you know what? In a sense, it's neither here nor there. It's just what it is. I am, you know, I'm not an obsessive idealist. I'm a, I'm a realist, you know, put it that way. So the point is that they, what the Americans have been able to do is solidify, that, solidify their sphere of influence to include uh, the collective West, by that I mean, um, you know, European Union, Britain, and some other countries at the periphery like Moldova. And on the other hand, and, you know, Australia, who were worried about China than they are about Russia, and, you know, Japan, South Korea, and, and Philippines in some ways that has some concerns about the Chinese and encroachment into uh, what they perceive to be their waters. Essentially, the United States is more economically more powerful and more needed. And I think that we will see that in relation to things going forward, the United States has been able to have a solid base in terms of firm allies that will stick to it for 50, 100 years or, or, or whatever else. Now, whether or not other countries will join it or tow behind China, different matter. But I think that the effect of, of, of the conflict, if we then add about the importance of the American, of Lockheed Martin and Raytheon in terms of production of military uh, <laughs> weapons, and, and obviously I didn't mention Taiwan, who now feel even more nervous about what the Chinese might do. Chinese didn't threaten them. They've said for a long time that, you know, at some point you're going to come home uh, ideally peacefully but by force if necessary and the Chinese approach has been we'll just wait it out but obviously you heighten the dangers that Taiwan could be under and I think the two defense companies were in Taiwan the other day signing deals or discussing our military hardware so from the USA's point of view um, and I'm not saying it's deliberate but the effect of it is that it's made the United States more powerful among a core. It's got a solid core behind it in respect of which it is uh, uh, the leader. If they had uh, been able to design what has happened or the effect of the conflict themselves, I don't think they would have, without the conflict, I don't think they could have achieved anything like this. So this is something that they have done. And, um, and in that competition with China and being able to get other countries behind, because there's a power competition going on, it's really going to be interesting going forward. Yes, it may well be that the Chinese will one day surpass the Americans, uh, although they do on purchasing power parity. The fact is that the Americans are not giving up without a fight. I tend to see the conflict as similar to the situation in which um, the, the, the British Empire knew that the America, the United States was rising and really couldn't try different things but couldn't do anything <laughs> to stop it. And the, in the end, what does the saying go? If you can't beat them, join them. Yes, yeah, so that's it.